afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. The Vermont Beef Industry Council reports that there are approximately 500 farms with some 5,500 cattle in the state. Cattle can be out on pasture during the growing season, but winter creates challenges for farmers. University of Vermont Extension researchers are looking at a new way to use the Vermont product to keep cows comfy in the winter and protect natural resources. Across the fences, Keith Silva was in Waitsfield to visit a farm that's chipping in on this new idea. Kenyon's Variety Store in Waitsfield stocks everything from cattle canes and snowmobile belts to hammers and hamburger that's raised right here. I guess that's who we are. It's a farm, but I guess it's the family hobby. It doesn't seem to make any money, so my accountant says it's a hobby. <laughs> Don't let Kenyon's sense of humor fool you. He's serious when it comes to his herd of 100 pasture-raised cattle and the products they produce. We sell a lot of it here, and we have a store in Northfield. They sell some there. Uh, several restaurants and retail outlets buy it. Just keeps growing in popularity, so it, it's it's rewarding in that aspect. I'm kind of biased about it. I really like it. <laughs> when the growing season slows or the ground's too soft, pasture-raised livestock are kept in what's called outwintering areas. Outwintering areas are often constructed out of gravel or concrete. They're expensive to build and maintain and can cause problems with runoff getting into waterways if not properly managed. And even when covered with sawdust or sand, concrete pads don't provide animals with much in terms of comfort. It was even difficult walking on it, you know, yeah. carrying the planks around. It was, uh, it was challenging. Kenyon was looking for an alternative to concrete when he met Joshua Faulkner the UVM Extension Farming and Climate Change Coordinator. Faulkner suggested Kenyon try wood chips. Cattle only been on it for probably five weeks now that, that we got them contained. Joshua said they'd be lured to it, and I didn't think so. And even before the fence was all up, the cattle got out and came over and they all laid on it. So he was right, I was wrong. <laughs> Why did you think it wasn't going to work? What, what was it? Was it weird? Was it odd? What was Just it? odd, yeah. I mean, why would the cattle be a, attracted to it versus whatever else they could uh, lay on? But I don't know if it creates heat or if it's softer. I don't know why they're attracted to it, but, but they are. It's obvious. It's just a, a, a Vermont scale system. Some of the solutions that are out there that are, that are being used are, are really designed for much larger farms, are really designed for Midwestern style farms. Um, you've got feedlots and, and, and systems that, that aren't what we do here in Vermont. And, and this, is, this is a really good fit for your small um, to medium sized farm. Um, and, and, you know, Doug, Doug doubted it um, because he, he, he just didn't have experience with it before. And Doug was was generous and great enough to be a guinea pig for us and we're really excited to learn more and this is the first one in Vermont. You know we want to see how these perform in these really cold weather winters that we have here in Vermont. Um, so, so we're still learning but by all accounts um, it's, it's five degrees today and, and things look like they're working really well so um, we're, we're optimistic. The cows are standing on about 12 inches of wood chips. Below that is a layer of drainage stone and piping that flows out to a nearby drainage pond. When the animals go back on pasture in the spring, the top three inches of wood chips will get scraped off, composted, and used as fertilizer on Kenyon's fields. Another environmental benefit is how well wood chips handle water. When you think about concrete, most of the rainfall on, the, the, the falls on the concrete with the manure runs off. You gotta deal with that water. You have to handle that water in a responsible way. When it rains on the, on the wood chip pads, those wood chips soak up a lot of that water. And then they re-evaporate it and, and they kind of act like a sponge. I've done some research on a couple of pads and we've seen a, a reduction in runoff of about 50%. So that's 50% less dirty water that you have to deal with. Um, and, and I think that's a real advantage when you think about um, the infrastructure you need, whether it's a holding pond or some sort of treatment system, um, pumping and spreading. Of, of how much money, time, and labor you have to put into dealing with that dirty water. And of course, you know, less dirty water you have, the less risk you have of, of potentially polluting. Kenyon's decision to install a wood chip pad aligns with the Vermont Agency of Agriculture's new required agricultural practices to limit runoff and improve water quality. We all are gonna to have to come into compliance with the runoff into the water systems and 
this is supposed to help mitigate that and hopefully it does it, it's a step in the right direction i like the idea of this system better than the alternative that i was offered i just i just hope it works i just think it's a a good alternative in addition to cost reduction cow comfort and environmental benefits there's also an economic bonus to putting in a wood chip pad. This just dovetails really well with our forest industry here in Vermont, you know, and especially we have some of the mills in Vermont that are making what they call a bolt chip. It's a, it's a wood chip that's used for heating schools, for heating um, um, other larger facilities. That's exactly the type of chip we want to use for these wood chip pads. It, and it's a chip you can't find in other places that don't have that heating market. So we're able to capture that Give those, give those meals some business in the summertime when we want to buy chips. When they're not selling chips to heat schools, we're able to give them some business, you know, kind of help one another between the farm and the forest sectors. Kenyon's Variety is a place where you can find almost anything. This wood chip pad is a first for Kenyon's and for Vermont, but it sure won't be the last. In Waitsfield, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Thanks, Keith. And a footnote to that story, UVM Extension worked with the Vermont Agency of Agriculture to install the wood chip pad at Kenyon's. Our next segment involves another aspect of Vermont's wood industry. Vermont is renowned for its maple trees, so you may be surprised to learn that there are over 100 million ash trees in our state. Ash trees play an important role in our economy, and they provide a myriad of benefits for wildlife and the environment. But the ash faces a number of threats, including invasive species like the emerald ash borer. So a statewide effort is underway to raise awareness of ash trees. Rebecca Gollin reports on a class of UVM students that's taking ash tree inventory. You know, maybe other people see that and it'll catch on. UVM students have long had a reputation as tree huggers, but this is not a nature appreciation class. We had a map and we were given, you know, specific sections of the city that as teams of three we went out and looked at, looked at all the ash and maple trees in the city and assessed kind of their overall health conditions at the time and uh, just were looking for, you know, any evidence or symptoms and signs of the insects to see if, you know, they were there. The insect warranting this scrutiny is the emerald ash borer, or EAB. It's an invasive beetle that decimates ash trees. Originally from Asia, the EAB was first seen in the U.S. around 2002, after being accidentally introduced in the Detroit area. Ash has a wide variety of uses. Just in Vermont, we have plants that are, are making uh, baseball bats and tool handles, up so to fine yeah, furniture. Is, um, so these are all ash. Paul Frederick is a wood utilization specialist with the Vermont Division of Forests. He works primarily with the forest product industry, where ash plays a big role. He recently helped put together a report on the economic importance of Vermont's forests. Roughly 7% of our standing wood in the state is, is ash. The, high, the biggest percentage is, is sugar maple. Um, and then if you, you know, going down the list, you, you end up with ash at about 7%. About 150 million trees, I think, is, what, is what's been thrown around as a number. Um, but when you, even though it's only 7% of the, of the standing volume, it's about, um, it's number, well, it's tied for number two as far as the amount of volume that's actually harvested and processed in the state every year. Sugar maple again, Frederick, most, along with many others, has been spending maple, a lot of time uh, lately thinking of ways the state can plan for the arrival of emerald ash borer. The insect has not been detected in Vermont, but those who track it know it's only a matter of time. When it comes into a new area, oftentimes it's moved by people moving firewood fairly innocently. You know, somebody has a tree die in their yard, so they cut that tree down into firewood and in the in the uh, lake states particularly they found that people were taking that ash firewood up to their camp in the unit in the upper peninsula or to wisconsin or you know parts of northern michigan um, and they ended up spreading the insect pretty quickly uh, that way so it tends to turn up in pockets and then expand from there um, not all ash are killed. We've, they've been able to determine that there are some ash that survive, uh, but 
98% of the ash uh, essentially dies in those areas from the infestation eventually. Emerald ash borer are pretty much all around the perimeter of Vermont. It's found in Canada, it's in New York, in New Hampshire. Professor Kimberly so Wallen teaches forest ecosystem health at UVM. Um, he, he it's fly. her students scattered across Winooski, antenna. surveying the street Whereas trees. The female moth, if you look at the body size, the female moth has a much larger, thicker body than the male. Previously, another student had gone around and measured the size and height of a whole bunch of maple and ash trees throughout Winooski, and what we were doing was going back and t retaking some of those measurements, seeing if there's been a change, if we notice that, oh, this tree is dying or sick or it's lost branches or, oh, it's been growing a lot in these past few years. While some of the groups surveyed the trees in the neighborhoods of Winooski, others focused on the downtown area where a number of the highly resilient ash trees line the streets. Overall, I'd say it's in pretty good health, would you? Yeah. When the review is done, the students will provide a final report to the town. With the street tree plans that we give the communities, that the, the, the students give the communities, um, they can forecast um, how they're going to manage uh, the ash trees. So uh, what that really allows is flexibility in budgeting. So it's very, very expensive to go in and do all the, the removal of the trees when emerald ash borer enters a community. Along with their report, Wallen students often spend time training citizen scientists and members of the community about how to spot signs of disease in their local trees. Having more eyes on the lookout for the insect could minimize damage. And what did you guys find? We didn't find any of the insects, which was really good news. Um, they're not, the emerald ash borer is not yet in Vermont, so that was kind of expected, but it's definitely good that we didn't find any, of course. And we found that the trees were overall pretty healthy, um, which is also really great, because um, the more vigorous the trees are, the more likely they'll be able to combat the insect, so. Uh, no woodpecker sign. I don't see any woodpecker holes. Planting trees and maintaining healthy trees in urban areas um, has numerous benefits to the community that they may, might not even be aware of, like uh, it can uh, help retain heat because uh, trees have a lot of leaves and um, that helps to retain some heat and then also um, providing shade, aesthetic values, also carbon storage, you know, these trees are soaking up carbon. The students will be back in Winooski to finish their survey another day, spending time in the field to get their hands on and arms around their subject. In Winooski, I'm Rebecca Gollin with Across the Fence. Thanks, Rebecca. Before we go, a reminder that you can join Across the Fence through our Facebook page. All you have to do is search Across the Fence on Facebook. We'll let you know what's airing each day and post that day's full program right after the broadcast. You can also find links to our website where you can access our program archive and find all the recipes from our monthly In the Kitchen program. And that's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. Uh -huh.